neither me nor uh, Yogo were members of this uh, research, but uh, I believe uh, what we are doing fits well uh, in, the, uh, in the whole uh, scheme of things. Uh, uh, Yogo is, uh, is another young migrant uh, economist like Nuno, but he made a mistake to migrate to the northern hemisphere, so we could not take the advantage of summer to be, to be here. But uh, I, I'm sure he is here in the spirit. Uh, let me just, uh, let me just uh, raise two points before I go into business. The, the first point is uh, I have to use the, uh, the equipment because uh, <coughs> I will have to show you a number of graphs. I hope they are not uh, too many. And uh, those uh, graphs, they uh, draw on data from uh, the national accounts. And uh, we, we, we try uh, to, keep, uh, to, keep, to keep in mind all the limitations of this uh, system <coughs> of accounts <coughs> and all the limitations of uh, of those, uh, those uh, data and sometimes and we can, can try in any way to make sense of, 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 those, uh, of those figures. So, last point, uh, this, is, this, is a, this is an exercise on, uh, you know, this keep it simple, stupid exercise, <laughs> so it may sound uh, it's intendedly mechanistic. What we are trying to do is to identify the mechanisms of the internal devaluation in the simplest form possible. Uh, having hope that uh, ourselves or possibly other will, will flash those bones, will give flash to those bones in a more rich uh, uh, narrative. I'll start with Olivier Blanchard. He was, uh, he was already evoked here. You know, Blanchard has always been very interested in Portugal and very well informed because probably because he had students, Portuguese students, working very close to the heart of uh, economic uh, thinking and policy making in Portugal. So. Ironically, he also came to co-preside the adjustment uh, in Portugal, so it's necessary to evoke Blanchard. And I evoke two passages from uh, Blanchard's literature. The first one, I, I take it from this 2007 paper, where he, uh, where he, he wrote that uh, increasing productivity growth is not easy, and will not happen overnight. The other way to re-establish competitiveness is to decrease nominal wage growth, or even in the current context of already low <coughs> Portuguese and European wage inflation, to actually decrease nominal wages. So this was written before the adjustment. So 10 years after, I recall this was a rock band, you know, Ten years after Blanchard came back to to, to assessing the uh, the uh, his ex experience, and he wrote with uh, Lawrence Summers, the events of the last ten years have put into question the presumption that economies are self-stabilizing, have raised again the issue of whether temporary shocks can have permanent effects and have shown the importance of non-linearities. It's a bit ironic if it was not uh, dramatic that uh, Blanchard would come with this, uh, with this, uh, you know, with this, with this, uh, you know, with non-linearities and permanent effects of shocks. <coughs> because uh, in respect to the question that whether temporary shocks can have permanent effects, he himself, Blanchard, who had work on the implications of hysteresis, at least since uh, 
1986 uh, should have known better that uh, this possibility indeed exists. But it is others, long before Blanchard, that we, we that I recall uh, when when dealing with the, the permanent effects of, uh, of internal devaluation. And I want to recall uh, Gunnar Myrdal and one uh, very old passage written in 1957, which goes in the normal case, a change that does not call forth countervailing changes, but instead supporting changes which move the system in the same direction as the first change, but much further. Because of such circular causation, a social process tends to be cumulative. So my point here that is that uh, internal devaluation is uh, an instance of uh, circular cumulative causation and this is uh, what I want to argue. I also want to argue that basically the non-linearity is present in uh, implicit in the argument of uh, circular cumulative causation are uh, those present when he stresses in discussion and that in the Portuguese economy, in, this, in the most obvious indicator, which is real GDP, there is a clear footprint of, uh, of uh, cumulative uh, circular causation, or if you like, hysteresis. So let me start with this, uh, with this keep it simple exercise. So when we start from the, the presence of a current account imbalance. And the, uh, and the idea that uh, an internal devaluation, meaning uh, decreasing nominal wages, in order to decrease prices and be competitive, price competitive in the, in the international market, would, uh, would be the, would be the, the recipe. So internal deval this, this is internal devaluation evaluations aim decreasing nominal wages, reduced costs and prices to boost exports and inhibit or possibly substitute imports. And the toolkit was the basic one, the first element and probably the most important, decrease length and the replacement rate of unemployment compensation. So if you want to have people accepting any wage which is offered in the market, you decrease the length and the replacement rate of unemployment compensation. This is effective in the context of uh, huge unemployment. Second, very direct instrument, just cut the public servants' wages. This is possible, it was done very directly. Then you can also reduce overtime compensation. So really pay lower, lower wages, uh, reduce severance pay, make, make uh, these missiles more cheaper, relax uh, these missile restrictions in general. This was embedded in the memorandum, as you know, and it was, in fact, it was put into practice. So internal devaluation in practice. Coming close to a discussion we, we had before, uh, what did it what did it really achieve in practice? It seems to me that it allowed labor intensive, which are also cheap labor sectors, so labor intensive tradable sectors. It allowed those sectors to meet external demand, had low prices by absorbing unemployed labor force at low cost. So meaning that uh, the effect of internal devaluation was not particularly, in terms of decreasing nominal wages, was not particularly strong in those intensive cheap labor sectors for a simple reason, because the minimum wage is very, those sectors are very dense in the minimum wages and uh, it's difficult to have nominal wages uh, decreasing. But it allowed the mass of unemployed workers to be displaced and absorbed in those sectors, meeting an external demand 
which was the only demand <coughs> existing in the period of <coughs> adjustment. So, data. So we first had, uh, let me first call your attention to real wages first. Uh, so real wages really were deflated from 2010 to 2012. And the most, the most, the most amazing thing is that they were evaluated to a point which is lower than the <coughs> beginning of the century level. And only now we are at, at the level of the beginning of the century in terms of real wages. Second, second point, prices and average compensation of employees, and I'll be talking of employees only, employees, not employment uh, employees, in the aggregate are really aligned, meaning that uh, uh, prices measured by the GDP deflator really followed more or less are very, very, very closely correlated with, with wages. Interestingly, however, when we look at the sectors, this alignment <coughs> of wages with prices is no longer present. What happens within sectors is uh, it's difficult to find a pattern there, simply because other factors at the sector level, like demand, how is it directed to, it, to, to such and such sectors, intervenes in the alignment of wages and, uh, and prices. No, I'm just about to do what Ricardo said uh, we should never do. Uh, inter internal devaluation, in fact, in fact produced the desired <coughs> And this was balance of trade became uh, balanced, uh, issuing the adjustment, and this was achieved by two means, a steep decline in imports due to internal demand which contracted and remaining stagnated until 2013, and <coughs> an increase in exports after since 2009, which actually takes the trend of a previous period here, so, uh, but nevertheless a, a decrease which, which still continues. So, the point is, uh, the point is the following. Although the desired effects were produced in terms of reducing nominal wages, reducing prices, and balancing the balance of trade, internal devaluation was obviously a disaster. This is the point to be made. Uh, reaching the self-proclaimed goals is no evidence of success. If other effects countervail the desired <coughs> goals. And this is what I want to argue. So, the step is labor-intensive tradable sectors responded to external demand and this was facilitated by uh, internal development. The figures in employment are really impressive. The decline in employment until the, between 2008 and 2013 is impressive as impressive as the, as the uh, recovery in the, in the following period. So now we are above the level of 2008, and I recall I'm talking about employees, not employment in general. Uh, but if we look at the sectoral picture, the thing is more New ones. What do we find? We have in blue, in yellow, we have the uh, evolution of employees between 2010 2013. And what we see 
is basically one sector standing out as losing employment. This is construction, obviously, followed by G, which is wholesale and retail trade, and by manufacturing. And then in the following period, and the, you know, the destruction of employment has cut across all sectors. <coughs> As in the following period, the creation of employment has also cut across all sectors, but with uh, two sectors standing out. So let's start with C, manufacturing. Actually, the recovery more than compensated, but more or less compensated the loss in the previous period. The same happened, happened in the trade, in retail trade. And if we really look at the sectors that have emerged, we have to look at uh, I and N, which created uh, with the creation of net employment between 2010 and 2019, one of the only two sectors, together with Q. Let me tell you, this is this is uh, accommodation and food services. N is administrative and support services. And maybe to make it clear which, what, what, what we are talking about, we are talking about uh, a lot of sectors connected with uh, those sectors which have been external, externalized by firms, so temporary work, uh, security, these type of things but also a lot of activities which are connected with tourism. So when we are pointing to those two emerging sectors, we are pointing basically to tourism. This is very obvious. Then we have also another sector here, which is interesting. It's an industry which has emerged from, from the adjustment, which is uh, social work activities. You know, social work activities uh, grew in employment. So, this is basically the picture, two emerging sectors connected to, with tourism. This is the basic picture. So let's try to find some structure here. So this is a classification of sectors by labor intensity, tradable, non-tradable, and uh, low wages. Low means just under the, the mean, and labor intensity means, uh, means uh, lo lower than the mean uh, labor intensity. So we have here, it seems to me, a pattern, which is sectors creating in employment are, in general terms, tradable sectors, the only demand available with an exception, which is, uh, once again, uh, social work activities. And within tradable sectors, we clearly have labor-intensive, low-wage sectors. And this is agriculture, manufacturing, accommodation, and this, uh, and this, uh, this is driven support service activities. Now, Reflecting the uh, directions of causation, uh, <coughs> we find uh, an important element in the whole uh, scheme, which is uh, migration, migration zones. Those have been evolved here, so we had since 2010 an inversion of fluxes with, uh, with permanent emigrants rising to historical levels and the permanent immigrants decreasing steeply. <coughs> Interestingly, great the large large part of those fluxes are with the people between 15 and 15, 64, so working age <coughs> population. And we have uh, an inversion of this uh, reversal in fluxes in uh, 2017, but the truth is that the is that emigration is still very much above the historical level. 
And uh, furthermore, from the qualitative, qualitative point of view, this uh, flows of emigration that has little to do with historical flows of emigration in the sense that this is highly qualified emigration. A figure came out uh, recently, 40% are people with higher level education living and, um, and this contracts with the, uh, with the, with the, uh, with the historical trend in Portugal. So this inversion of migration flows translated into an obvious decline of working age population. This is a huge decline, it's uh, 500,000 people disappearing from the working age population in, uh, in a few years. And the implication is that uh, the previous situation in the, the labor market started to change. They speak about labor markets like a fortunate expression, but this, uh, this really, this margin in the labor market between working age population <coughs> and the level of, employ of employment really contracted, producing, uh, producing a situation which is very different from the one existing in uh, 2013. So this, uh, this may explain recent data, which somehow, at least for me, was surprising. Uh, now, this recent data is administrative data coming from Social Security, so it gives us a very uh, up-to-date up picture <coughs> of what is going on. And what apparently is going on is that um, wages are picking up, wages are indeed picking up. Um, since December, the end of 2017, and they are picking up, these are year-to-year -year percent of variations, they are picking up presently at a level of close to 3%, 3% level. Moreover, if we, if we look into what is happening to wages with the same data within sectors, we find that uh, wages are picking up precisely in the low wage, labor intensive, tradable sectors connected with tourism. So, sector, this service to firms, this service to firms stands out as a sector where wages grew, grew to, grew, what, grew above the mean, but second is immediately, uh, but a large increase also in uh, tourism accommodation. In spite of the fact that uh, those sectors connected with tourism are being, uh, are being uh, fed by migrants, which is also a fact, wages are picking up in those, in those sectors. So the point is, uh, the point is, uh, is, is the following, is, uh, is the loop really closing so we might think that uh, since emerging sectors, and I mean those connected with tourism, are also sectors with a low, a very low potential for productivity growth, increasing labor costs that means either that, uh, that those, those wage increases are passed on to prices, and considering the model of tourism prevailing in Portugal, which is one based in uh, price competitiveness, passing on wages, wage increases to prices would mean, or could mean, 
compromising price competitiveness. This is one possibility. Another possibility is that the, those wage increases are indeed absorbed. But this, is, this would turn out in the end compressing pro, pro, profit margins, which, uh, which probably are not as large as uh, as uh, as those in other in other sectors. So this could translate into into a into a into a, a situation which which we might be living right now where wage recovery which seems indeed to exist could translate into increased <coughs> internal demand which is present in the statistics and uh, into pressure on the uh, external parts. Of course making predictions of this type is uh, risky but uh, this would close the loop, this uh, scenario. This would anticipate something like coming back to a situation where current account imbalance once again would be addressed by uh, internal devaluation in a situation where internal devaluation is the only available tool to, to allow, to allow the uh, to allow the uh, continuation of the current uh, <coughs> things. In fact, if we look into the external balance, it means another thing. These are just a few quarters, but since the third quarter of 2018, the, uh, there was a, a reversal of the, the position of imports and exports. And this would lead us to conclude the following. So first <coughs> point, internal devaluation allowed labor-intensive, cheap labor tradable sectors to meet external demand at low prices and absorb unemployed labor force at low cost. The inversion of migrate, migration flows combined with unemployment growth reduce the slack in the labor market and boosted wage recovery. This wage recovery, which asymmetrically affects most labor costs of emergent intensive sectors, puts, puts those sectors in a position where either they pass on those costs to prices, compromising the model of price competitiveness, prevailing or compressed, compressed profit margins and leading to the possibility of the loop closing with a new external imbalance. So, just to, to conclude with, the, with the, the way forward to give flesh to this, uh, to this mechanistic, uh, mechanistic model of internal devaluation. One way is obviously to bring in finance uh, and to, to see how patterns of, in finance uh, fit into this, uh, this uh, real downward cumulative causation circle. And what seems to me the direction into which I would like <coughs> to, to explore, it goes a bit in line with what uh, Nuno is doing and what we have to do together, by the way. Uh, I would investigate the possibility that uh, a shift in the financial regime, or fi between financial regime, occurred during the adjustment from one uh, based on credit and the mediation of uh, national banks to another one based on uh, real asset alienation. So the one based on credit, um, 
Now the inflows were flows of credit coming to, which were then recycled by the national banks into, into consumers and investors, and they had as an outflow <coughs> the financing of the, 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 the current account deficit. There's another outflow, probably more important than we are able to, to quantify, to finance uh, foreign investment, investment of, the, of still existing Portuguese groups in, at the time. The third one, just to service debt. The new regime would, would have as uh, inflows real assets acquisition. So I'm thinking of not only of real estate, but it is obvious, dispensing banking, uh, the mediation of banking, as the normal just, but also firms, existing real assets, already existing, no new investment involved here, but we're thinking of the electric, <coughs> electric grid, of the, you know, everything which was privatized, accounts, and which has as outflows uh, dividends, rents, uh, and debt service. What is very much unclear to me, and this is what I suggest we should think a bit, is uh, not only whether this uh, regime changing <coughs> financial the financial model did, it, did really take place, but also how it fits the uh, real adjustment in the economic structure and uh, the real adjustment in uh, wages and prices, which took place facilitating uh, the structural sectoral adjustment.